So it helps you with self-regulation and emotional regulation because it gives you that sense of your body, your body state, you're inside your body. And it helps with all of these, problem solving, flexibility. You have to understand what's going on within you so you understand also what's going on with somebody else. So part of, I'm not saying it's the only means, but part of being for the for, um, perspective, taking an empathy, I have to know how things feel inside me to then have empathy to know what's feeling inside of you and to be able to read social cues. I've got to have that self-awareness first. And if you're not getting from the physiology from your body, does that make sense? So to me, it's a huge thing. Um, and one example they gave, if that makes any sense, is like if you had a car without a gas gauge, then how would you know when you were almost going to be out of gas? It's the same thing. I mean, you could kind of figure out what driven for so many days, but you'd have to be then figuring it out. But this is, so they kind of give that example of that being part of the inner reception, because it's like if you had your gas gauge, it was not working. Okay, so this other sense, we know this one more, um, and it's a really big one as well, because it plays a role in not just how you feel things, but it plays a role in your whole body scheme of kind of knowing my body, my envelope, who I am here is a big one for boundaries, because that's how I know if I'm too close to somebody or not. I don't know about you, but we work with a lot of kids that get super close to us. And part of that is social, part of that is that they've been abused, but part of that is that they don't get their skin. They don't know where their skin ends and mine begins, because they don't get it from the body. It has to start with the body, it has to start with the basics. Does that make sense? And it also affects fine motor skills. So imagine wearing gloves and then having to handle coins or keys or writing. Well, for a lot of our kids, it is like they're wearing gloves. They're not, but they don't sense things, so it's almost like they're wearing gloves. And you look at them, and some of them, they look like, when they're like picking up things or you're testing them for fine motor, they drop things, they drop, because it's like they're wearing these big gloves on because they don't, they don't sense it. The other, re the other thing I give you is the example of Novocaine. When you have Novocaine, or if, if your, your arm went numb a little bit, how it, like later you, don't, you, can't, you can't really tell how big or wide it is and you can't feel things. So that's kind of like the same thing. The important thing is that all of these primary senses are important for just basic development. And I like this, except it's missing. What's it missing down here? Ooh, I can, I can play with this fancy thing. Ooh, look. What's missing down here? Interoception. It's going to be a big one. I'm so excited about that. Um, so anyways. Most of the time, what are we looking for with our kids, right? We want them out here. This is what we're looking for. You know, can they learn? Can they play? Can they? But it's, it's, it starts down here. And if they're not getting this, it's going to be a lot harder to develop this up here. OK? So now we're going to use touch. And I kind of touched, oh, I, that was good. I kind of touched on that already. Um, so the tactile sense, OK? So you gather information. What kinds of things do you gather through the sense of touch? Hot, cold. OK. What else? Soft, hard, sharp or not sharp, smooth or not, heavy or not. So all of that is information. So, so part of the way we use our sensory systems in general, and I'm just going to use touch as the example, is that we use it to gather information. So with vision, what information are we gathering? Lots, like lots and lots and lots. Like, you know, 70, 80% of what we gather in the world is visual. What kind of information are we gathering? This is called discrimination. So what are we gathering with vision? Near, far. Mm -hmm. What else? Color, shape, beauties. Yeah, so everything we're seeing, we're discriminating. Is how you gather the information around it, okay? The second thing is, so the hot and cold is actually more the survival part in a way. OK, because you have to, to survive. So for example, with touch, it's not like I get next to a stove that's hot, and my brain doesn't go, oh, that's kind of hot. Maybe I should move my hand there. It just that doesn't happen. It's like an automatic thing because it's part of survival. So a big part of our sensory systems is survival. OK. So we're going to talk about what can go wrong. So when you're not processing information correctly through our sensory systems, most of the time, you can have an occupational therapist, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Test them to see what's going on. And so if they have problems with processing information, it's called sensory processing disorder. And there's a little handout that gives you the 10 fundamental facts about SPD. So it's important to kind of see that, because it, it kind of gives you a sense of how important it is and how if you miss that, that can affect a lot of the kids' behaviors and such. So it's, 
It affects developing children as long. We talked about that. Um, at least one in 20 people in the general population may be affected by SPD. That's a lot. I, I had another statistic that said that children with sensory sensitivities have a 30% greater chance of having anxiety or having issues with anxiety. Um, heredity may be a cause of their, it can run in families. So sometimes you'll start testing a kid and the mom will say, well, God, I was kind of like that as a kid. Now, we are seeing a lot of the adults that we work with uh, when I do my stress reduction group and I talk to them about what stress is, you know, we're talking about stress and what's a stressor. If they say people, or they say life, or they say like everything, I start asking them questions and there's a questionnaire I can give them for adults because a lot of these individuals have sensory processing issues that create a lot of the anxiety, that create one of the reasons, if not the main reason, but at least one of the reasons they're using because they've been trying to calm that nervous system because they've been having issues with how they take in the world around them. And so that's one of the reasons. So, so I, I've been seeing that. And I don't see it with everybody that comes in with chemical dependency, but we're seeing, we, su we su do see some of these individuals. Okay, and let me see if there's something else here that's important. And there is a difference between ADHD, the physiology. So a lot of the kids with ADHD will present, you can have co-occurring, and we're gonna talk about that in one of these slides. But a lot of times kids with ADHD, really what they have is sensory processing. And there's physiologically, they've done some studies that there is a difference in how they present and part of, and the part of the brain that they're presenting. So let's talk about what can go wrong. If you cannot discriminate information from the different things, what you're gonna see with most of these kids is that they cannot have, they're not gonna be as coordinated. They're gonna look clumsier. They're gonna have a harder time figuring out what's going on in the world around them, okay? For most of these kids that have discrimination problems, they're gonna be more like the learning disabled kids, so they might have problems with the auditory processing, visual processing, so that, I'm not saying that it causes dyslexia, but you might see, see some kids with dyslexia in this category here, having this issue. They're gonna have a hard time with just knowing their bodies in space and their, their whole body scheme and knowing themselves through their body. And a lot of these kids are gonna have a lot of problems with self-esteem, and so actually I see self-esteem with almost all the kids that I work with, but they might be slower in processing information. Their confidence is gonna be affected. And again, I'm not saying that every kid I see with attention-seeking behaviors or temper tantrums have sensory processing issues, obviously not, but you might see some of this happening as well, okay? Because they're gonna get frustrated because they don't get the world. And a lot of these kids that have this discrimination problems, I see them and they, they can be bright, but they don't get it. It's like they get it up here, but they don't get it through their bodies. And a lot of these kids do a lot of talking through things because they can't do it. Um, and so they get really frustrated and they wanna control things a lot. I see a lot of control things as well with some of these kids that have discrimination problems. So then you can also have problems with motor issues besides the, 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 the main, some of the coordination, but some of this is even bigger. So you're gonna have kids that have a lot of postural issues and what that means is kind of we talked about that, the kids that have really low tone, their balance is not great, so they, they are, they're clum really, really clumsy. They're gonna have more accidents. Um, and then they're gonna have something called dyspraxia. So the ability to organize and sequence motor tasks, the ability to know time and space perception of knowing that, that comes from gathering information and coordinating it through the, these motor systems. So these are kids that even, even if they're bright, they take a lot longer to learn to dress themselves or to learn to, to tie their shoes. They're gonna get really frustrated with that. Because I mean, I have a lot of kids that come to 10, 11, and the parents say they still can't tie their shoes. They've just given up on that. Because that takes the ability to, to use information from proprioception, from the tactile system, from vision, putting it all together. You have to have good stability, good vestibular to know you're upright. All of that has to coordinate to be able to do that. Um, there's a condition that's even broader called somatodyspraxia where these kids, they even like ideas. So praxis, you have to start with an idea of what to do. So when you're given a new problem or a new car to drive or something new, we usually have at least an idea of how to start. These kids, they really lack an idea. So for example, if they've never make a, made a bed before and you have them make a bed, they get really frustrated because they don't even have an idea that you would maybe pick up the best friend and, and throw it. I mean, they, that, that would not even occur to them to throw it. These are kids that will stand in the shower and they might be 10, 11, 13, and they'll just stand there. The parents, they have to like walk them through every step, even though they've been sh showering now for like 10, 15, you know, 10 years or so, because they don't have the idea and they haven't been able to learn the sequence, even with repetition, and it has nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with that they're not processing the information correctly 
through all these sensory systems. And so they really, really have a hard time coordinating and processing information. And as a result, of course, they're going to have poor frustration tolerance, low self-esteem, a lot of problems with self-care skills that's not on there. And these are also going to be very controlling kids. They really want to control because they, they, they don't understand their world. It's hard for them to figure out. But these are the kids that you're going to see them really, really struggling more with motor skills and, and, and figuring out things. And a lot of them are also going to have, some of the kids that I work with have a hard time with articulation because they're not, they're not able to feel inside their mouth. And that's what the touch system gives us. How to, how to form words. And that's not the only reason you have articulation problems, but a lot of these kids are going to have a hard time with articulation as well. And then this is the biggest area that I'm going to speak to, because this is what we see most of the problems with. So I would say that where I work, 90 to 95% of the kids I work with have sensory modulation problems. So this might seem more familiar. So modulation starts with the modulation of just your basic biological rhythms. So this is where interoception, I think, plays a big role. Sleeping, eating, knowing when you're hungry, knowing when you're sleeping, bowel and bladder control. These are issues that you see a lot with the, the kids on the spectrum having problems with that. And that has to do with how you regulate or modulate information. So that's a big one. And then you've got the ability to modulate your arousal. So I, I, when I had you all up and moving and I wanted you all to move your head around, and move, it's because I wanted you all to get a, a bigger arousal so that you all could really be more awake because I know you all were sitting and have eaten something and it's after lunch to get you up and having the ability to arouse, to regulate. But kids that have problems with arousal regulation, it's usually based on sensory modulation problems. And these are the subtypes that we're going to look at. So these are the, the risk takers. These are the bungee jumpers of the world. And there's adults out there. And again, you can have some of these issues and not have a sensory processing issue. Uh, this is part of it here. So these are kids that are always seeking extreme amounts of input. I literally have asked kids on a regular basis or parents if they've jumped off of a, like a really tall tree or off of a second story. And you know how many times I hear yes? Which is why I ask it, because I kept hearing it so much. I'm like, I'm just going to start asking that. They would say, well, of course. And like, why? Because it was there. So they'll take these risks. They, don't, they, they just want that intensity. Okay? And it's usually movement intensity, but it can be intensity of flavors and intensity of sound, and it can be other intensity. But they seek all these. And so they are going to be taking all these risks. They tend to be impulsive. Boundaries are poor. And again, they're having a hard time with arousal regulation. And they're going to come across as very disruptive. So what population does this sound like? ADHD. And again, there are some ADHD kids that have sensory issues, and there are kids that have sensory issues that do not have ADHD. Okay? So it can be co-occurring or it can be confused with ADHD. But it isn't just ADHD. I work a lot with kids with mood dysregulation, right? And bipolar disorder. So I see this a lot too, because these are the kids that it's one way or the other. It's one way or the other. So they have a hard time regulating themselves, regulating their arousal, regulating the world around them and what comes into them, and they have a really hard time with that. So these are the sensory seekers. Then you have kids that are under-responsive. So they don't feel things. They're not aware of, let's say, pain, which is really a, a serious thing. So if you're not aware of pain, not only is it a safety issue, it's an issue for empathy. So we talked a little bit about that with interoception. That interoception is part of this pain process. If you cannot feel pain, then how do you know when you're hurting somebody or how rough you are with somebody? Or, and so I see a lot of kids like that that don't, then don't have a sense of, and I'm not saying maybe that's the only reason you, you develop empathy, but you can see where that plays a big role. And for our psychiatrists that I work with, they will always want to know about this information. And it's one of the questions that you might want to start asking families is, can, does your kid feel pain? Because not only is that a safety concern, but that, that really gives you a sense of what's going on. And for a lot of them, they also have a hard time regulating their temperature. So we work with a lot of kids that are always wearing jackets. Now, there are other reasons for that, because they like the weight of that. Uh, but a lot of times, they can't regulate the temperature either. Or kids that are, you know, go out in the cold, and they have no sense of that. Or kids that you have to wash them, because they'll get scalded in the shower or something, because they can't regulate. Like at our hospital, the temperature already regulates, so it's not an issue for safety. but. But at home, it could be an issue because they can't regulate the temperature. Okay? These kids tend to have really low arousal. So like this. Flat affect, very little energy. They look depressed. 
They could be depressed also. So we have kids that are depressed but also have this. Okay. So we just tested a young man like that who's got supposedly schizophrenia, uh, OCD, and anxiety. And he does look kind of anxious, but he looks kind of flat. I mean, like flat, like nothing. And if anything, he looks kind of like this, like he's scared and kind of flat. We put him on a swing. I, was, I wasn't even expecting I've been doing this for a long time. Put him on a swing. This kid was like, oh, I, like his face lit up like a light bulb. I just could not believe it. So I started asking him, what kind of flavors do you like? What kind of flavors do you think he likes? What flavors is he going to like? Spicy. Love spicy food. Love sour foods, right? So this is a kid that probably is under aroused, probably has schizophrenia and depression maybe and anxiety. I'm not saying he doesn't have that, but there's this other piece here. So if I can get his vestibular system, I think it's mainly vestibular, Again, I've got some exercise I'm going to give him so he can move and stuff like that. I'm hoping that it'll brighten up his affect and he'll start feeling, because he doesn't, he cannot, he's got interception problems. I started asking him, he has no sense of what's going on inside the body. And he's a pretty bright kid. A lot of our kids that we work with have low IQ, but this kid is it's like maybe borderline, which is on our high end for our kid, the kids that I see. Um, and they really appear unmotivated or lethargic or withdrawn, inattentive. But a lot of them say they don't have the energy to do it, and it has to do with that arousal, usually with the vestibular system. But you can arouse them through food as well. So these are the kids that do need the warheads and the pickles and the pickle juice and all these different things to kind of throughout the day and keep them moving, have moving activity throughout the day. Does that make sense? To ha until that brain can start adjusting it on its own and self-regulating, that's what the therapy is for. So that's being under-responsive, 